Once again, the founder of the Natural Law Institute and the driving reason as, um, as to why we are all together. Are you going to blame me again? Yes, I am. <laughs> because it's your fault. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. No, that's for kids. Fault <laughs> <laughs> well, is fine. Blame is the one that gives you. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, so, once again, Kurt Doolin. Thanks, guys. Love you, man. Thank you. So, so, you know, on the schedule, I'm supposed to talk about what Luke did. And now I don't, now I don't have to do that, but that was part of a client cutting ploy. Beca because I wanted to, I, after listening to you guys yesterday and uh, thinking about what, what you uh, responded to, I thought of two things. Once, um, there are people who are better talking about rah rah than I am, and they're like basically everyone else on the management team. <laughs> um, and there, are, and, and I think Martin and I are the ones that have to do all the all the dirty work in <laughs> the plumbing. So I figured I would do I would take a risk and try something with you guys, guys that I haven't done uh, in a speech before because I've been afraid to. <laughs> so I hope this goes over quite well. As you know, that I gave an overview of the feminine yesterday. Right, which is the feminine method. This this conference was originally going to be called. What do we were to call it? The, pa uh, pathological. the pathological feminine. The problem is we're afraid people would misunderstand. They wouldn't understand the level of abstraction that that term means <laughs> to us. All right. So um, so I thought about it and I said, well, we did. I did the overview. Martin did the history. Right, and. So I did the, basically the biology, Martin did the history, and I would say, well, can I actually talk about Abrahamism in detail uh, for a bit and go, go into the weeds with it? And I thought this crowd might appreciate that. Was I right or wrong in that decision? Yes. Yeah. All right. And so, um, so now I got to add a bit of humor, which is that Brad, my, he started out basically being a, what you call a, an editor, which is a... It's a, called a developmental editor. It means, means that when you know what you want to say and you're not sure how to say it, you get a developmental editor. <laughs> That's different from an editor who is the person who tells you once it's done uh, to refine it and once you uh, have it refined, how to fix the punctuation, grammar, phrasing, and all that stuff. So it's like three jobs. So Brad said you can't talk about this. <laughs> and so, and I'm like, I can't talk about this. Like, it's the end point of the work, right? I mean, it's the whole point is to talk about it so we can learn to outlaw the behavior. And so uh, I've been reluctant to, even though I've basically written a book on it that, <laughs> that I hide from everyone, I, I, uh, I haven't put it out there because Brad made me afraid. Oh. oh, no, that's not really true. But Brad is like, um, he just is like water on a rock, and I'm a rock, so... Uh, it, it just took a while. Now it's the other way around. No, you should talk about this. This is good. This is <laughs> helpful. So if it's okay with you, the problem is it won't fit. It, because there's a lot of diagrams and lists, there's no way to put it in slides. So I had to do it this way. Is that okay? Sure. Correct. Um, I have uh, asthma. I've been very ill. I have asthma, as you know. And so I've reduced lung capacity. So if I have to breathe a little bit, I apologize. Um, so, I'm going to start out this talk, and it's a bunch of—it's basically a bunch of web pages I pulled up, right? The, the web pages are mostly from uh, the book, all right? Now, mo what may, you may or may not know is that we have in progress a series of volumes. When I originally drafted what we're doing, what we all discussed, it was around—it it was between 1,500 and 3,000 pages. Who's going to print that or read it or even lift it? You have to break it up. So we broke it up into volumes. And then one of the Brad's primary contribution from my standpoint, besides um, making sure I'm still alive today, is that uh, he, t he uh, helped me decide on moving it to teaching the science first because I'd started teaching the logics first, 
which is great for me because guess what I am? I'm an epistemologist and a logician first. Uh, the rest of it is just a consequence. And guess what? Nobody could understand what the F I was talking about. Then I, so, so I said, okay, well, I'll go back and I'll start with ethics. Well, you, so you can start in the ethics and work both directions. Great. That didn't work either. Uh, people could understand the ethics, but not the how the heck I got there. So we decided, what Brett and I decided was we would start with the science because that would illustrate the first principles by which the universe is constructed, and we would build up from those first principles as a consistent story of the development, the evolution of all, everything from the quantum background to complex language as a hierarchy. So we divided into, into volumes. I took my original stuff, which is propertarianism, and I put it in the dummy's guide because that's how it sounds to me when I read it today. But propertarianism, I should not try to avoid that term like I thought I should because it was like, I want to I wanna get away from this ethics as being the point of my work, but ethics was the original start of my work. I started with ethics and I worked outward. Um, but the next one is the history, and this history includes what's called the conflict series, which is the history of the development of mankind, uh, uh, our neoteny and everything else from out there and our cultural differences and our geostrategies, but mostly it positions modernity as a conflict between the two intellectual elites in the world, which is the Westerners and the Ashkenazi, who are also, frankly, half Westerners. And that difference is simply the masculine and feminine. That's what this book says, right? That is the history of it. The science is how Brad and I have come to d describing this uh, sequence. Uh, we, these are, technically speaking, there are, uh, in traditional language, there are uh, four sciences. The physical sciences, the behavioral sciences, the applied sciences, and, lo and the logics. Logics being a science, something I rejected for a long time, but I have uh, acquiesced to it. Um, and so we originally we organized it this way. Somewhat, it's still organized in this fashion. Um, if you follow us closely, you see us working on it. It's incredibly good work. I'm very proud of it. I really feel like we actually got it down. Then uh, we've been working on the logics right now, which is the short version of it. So if you've seen Brad and I do work on the short version recently, and we are in the process of the cognitive laws, which Brad, uh, has, Brad says it has caused me to live in your head, is something like that? Rent free. Rent free. Once you sort of get this stuff, you can't unget it, right? I mean, uh, the next would be the Constitution Law. I contribute this most to myself, uh, Martin and Brandon. Um, uh, we've got that in pretty good shape. It isn't terribly more advanced than it was in uh, 2000, but we have definitely worked on um, the, the, the adding the precision that's in the science to the Constitution. Um, I'm not, <clears throat> you notice there's nothing underneath this? You can't share that. You can't share that. Um, and then there's the prosecution, which takes this, some of that history stuff. Um, our strategy, the prosecution of it, the special pleading of Jews and Muslims is warfare. All right, so if you look at this, the hierarchy here, the volumes, it's a, it's a lawsuit. That's what we're producing. We're producing a, a vast, detailed uh, scientific lawsuit against the leftist uh, destruction of Western civilization because of this conflict between the masculine elites and the feminine elites. This is a condensed version of, I think of it as, it's almost like a mythology. It's when we take, you know, that shirt that uh, has the Western European group strategy or the European group evolutionary strategy on it. It's sort of a... Um, a very short book on that that everybody will get. I think of it sort of like the Ten Commandments, maybe, right? That kind of thing, a very short work. And then this is what we plan to do if, we live, if I live long enough, which is, the, is to revise the myths and legends so that they adapt to our, uh, in other words, because we have the matter of Greece and Rome, the matter of uh, France, the matter of Germany, the matter of England. We have these. Now we've got the matter, of, thanks to the Slavs, we've gotten the matter of the Slavs too, which is basically when, when the weird matter in the classical contents basically means the mythology and philosophy of, 
right? It's a collection. So the problem when you study uh, the when you study something like the Bible and or the Torah and whatever, you're, that's a really condensed version, right? If you go to somebody and say, "Study the Western tradition," how many books is it? Adler tried to reduce it to a hundred, didn't even come close. That's the problem. So what are we doing? What's our effort? What are we reducing? We're creating this thing called a constitution and a body of law. But what is it really? Brandon said it yesterday. It's our religion. The rest of it is the mythology around the religion that makes it educable and intergenerally transferable. But we're writing this down specifically because of the advantage of having a condensed, descriptive version. And who showed us how to do that? The Jews did. Uh, add a volume nine to write some science fiction. Well, science fiction, oh, thank you. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> Am I telling you you're too smart and too charming and too good lately? Because it feels like I'm doing that like every time I talk to you. Um, so uh, science fiction, uh, especially the great, the great science fiction from the 20s through the uh, 60s, maybe really into the early 70s, um, is the conversion of Greek tragedy into modern, the Greek, Greek, uh, Greek and Roman myths, the Aristotle myths. You mean, when was Ivanhoe written? Any literary people here can remember that? Exactly, it's 1800 somewhere. So that whole tradition is transferred into the scientific and technological. I actually thought it was the, the, most, Im, the most important thing that had been done in literature in the 20th century, because if you look at most literature they teach in the 20th century, it's literature of communism. We don't need that. No, it's terrible. Um, so anyway, I wanted to get, uh, the point I want to make is, this is the scope of work. I showed you 60 some odd slide yesterday. That thing I did is actually a thousand slides, over a thousand slides condensed to 60 slides. That's how much detail we have. There's thousands of pages of work here and extraordinary detail. So the, our problem has been, okay, how the hell do you get that across? My view was, okay, uh, I need you guys to understand at least basically most of this uh, at a high level. But what the public needs to understand is the Constitution. Now, our Constitution adds what's missing from our, our existing Constitution. It preserves the rule of law, natural law, and um, divided government, you know, which is the trifunctionality of government. It maintains that. It maintains commonality, which is, means the empirical findings of the common decisions of the courts of the common law, right? Which means that and what is decidability in the court of common law? What they call equity, but we really mean non-aggression, private property, reciprocity, and sovereignty. That's what that means. The other th thing, and this is, I hate this because this is what the left is trying to undermine, is there's commonality in the via negativa, right? In dispute resolution. That's how you solve sovereignty. But how do you do it in the via positiva of commons creation we call legislation? You do that by concurrency. It's called concurrency. It means that the classes, regions, and it should now be sexes, use houses of government to create a market for the production of commons which protects the sovereignty of individuals and the interests of minorities against what would happen in majority democracy. But what does the left try to sell? Majority democracy to destroy the interests of the individual groups and the sovereignty of individuals. They're trying to destroy concurrency. When they try to override the law what are they, with illegal activism, taking advantage of holes in our Constitution, what are they doing? They're trying to override commonality. So if you override commonality, concurrency, and the natural law, what are you doing? You're destroying the scientific basis of Western civilization. We call it science, we call it, which is technically investigation, but it's actually empiricism. There's no ideology in the West. The only ideology is sovereignty of the individual, creating the opportunity for status by contribution to the commons, which produces a, a polity with high trust that can produce commons at scale, and we're the only people that can do it other than the Japanese. So in, in effect, the way I look at our work is I'm producing a voluminous, detailed, 
unassailable, future protected, a common law suit against the state, the result of which is a constitution of natural, common, concurrent law in the Republican model that protects the sovereignty of the individuals, the preferences of the minority, which means locality, and the uh, and the fosters cooperation between the sexes, classes, and if necessary, races. What so what does the left try to do? But with, with uh, labor Marxism, uh, cultural Marxism, race Marxism, sex Marxism or family Marxism, truth Marxism, postmodernism, woke, which is uh, anti-Western, explicitly anti-Western, anti-white male. What are they trying to destroy? They're trying to destroy our ability to use markets for reconciliation of differences, preserving the sovereignty of the and of individuals and the right of groups to form their own polities. They're doing it on purpose with a structured attack, just as well as, I mean, uh, we've got a, the daughter of the, the military, one of the founders of military game warfare. So when you, so if you look at how to take over a country, that you put, produce a plan. And that plan isn't something that you try to say, this has to happen, then that has to happen, then that has to. It's not like that. You're trying to always move one, get one advantage in an OODA loop ahead of the opposition until their ability to resist you is no longer there. And you know that's what's happening, right? That's what demoralization means. It means you've lost the ability to organize by your value, prop your value systems, your shared value systems. And they're destroying it on purpose by design, starting with, what's his name? Gramsci. So uh, his thing was, we can't defeat them by, uh, by creating this Marxist insurrection. It won't work because the capitalism is better for people. That's what they decided. He decided it early, right? So his idea was cultural Marxism, which was to tack the march to the institutions of cultural production and destroy them. Now, this guy isn't Jewish, he's Italian. I don't know why that works. I used to have work for, I, I'm trying to, I'm really digging it. I'm digging at my buddy back there because I'm trying to get a reaction. See, he got him to smile good. Um, so so uh, I used to work with uh, the, almost exclusively Jewish companies when I was young. That's why I ended up putting them all in jail. And uh, you think I'm joking. I do, I'm not joking. They really went to jail. <laughs> I, I, made a, I could have made a career out of it. How do you think I know this stuff? <laughs> so, uh, it's a good story. I, I had to get out of the business, though, because it's like if you dance with the devil, you become one, right? I mean, it's like you get out of it. So I made a promise to my wife uh, when we got married I wouldn't do that anymore. Um, so... Uh, so uh, Gramsci, uh, Gramsci, is it Gramsci or Gramsci? I don't know how to say it, actually. Um, uh, developed cultural Marxism and then the March to the Institutions. The, uh, the, this was picked up by the Frankfurt School with Marcuse and all those other guys, right? I mean, who unfortunately trained Hans Hopp, which is why he can't fix Hans. He's, uh, he's busted. Well, he's German in the first, where's our German guy? What, what is it with Germans that once they get set on something, it's just not gonna freaking change? Well, duty. duty, that's what it is, all right. So uh, I'm definitely a Hoppian, but I like to pick on Hans now and then. Um, so they got picked up by the Frankfurt School and they said, damn it, it won't even work here. Cultural Marxism might work, but we need a lever. We need to create a bunch of allies to be able to do it. Where can we do that if we can't do it with labor? We can go to America and do it with blacks. That's exact, like people said, oh, that's a conspiracy. No, they wrote it down. They said what they were gonna do and they went and did it. They organized, financed it, planned it, and maintained it over long periods of time. They keep turning up the temperature on the boiling water so the frog doesn't notice, which is why this, this the demoralization works. So they go to the Frankfurt School and then they brought it over to New York at Columbia and they've gradually made it into California. And between the two coasts, they brought it together through the media and the entertainment business. And then because our Jewish friends are the only competitors, I'm very proud of my, uh, my uh, English uh, upper class heritage. Um, the only people have an IQ distribution equal to, equal to or better of it. And it turns out there's more of them. Because you know why? Rich white people don't reproduce. 
Jews redistribute their reproduction through their rabbis, who are their smartest people. So, you, so if, like, I'm very really good friends with, and I won't mention him because I don't want it to, I don't want to, whatever, but I'm very good friends with a certain conservative rabbi that's quite popular. Um, it's, it's more than friendship, it's a devotion, I would say. And uh, they, the community pays him to have kids. So, you know, he's producing kids that are exceptionally and verbal, verbally t talented, uh, in this, in, uh, in, and especially in the difference since the Jewish culture is cognitively feminine. They search for agreement regardless of truth, and we search for truth upon which to establish agreement where there will be no retaliation. But in the Jewish culture, they don't. They search, they search for agreement regardless of the truth and regardless of consequences. So basically, we think like Vikings, and they think like the bazaar. All right, so have I set the stage enough? I've said what I'm trying to produce is a common lawsuit against the state because, for the reconciliation of differences because there are holes in our self-awareness of our strategy, which needs to be embodied just as rigorously on our law as a defense against enemies who would use the feminine means of society, social destruction and undermining to cause, di di to cause division in order to end the market among peers and bring about the, fem the mother's demand for authority over her children. We have to guard our essential vulnerability. Yes. And that's the, our weak point. I was trying to say, I was trying to say, should, who was speaking? I was like, I can't remember what, who, which one of you it was yesterday. I was like, can I, should I push this button right now and see if I can get anybody else to say it? But uh, the, the, the big question I always say is, and I want to thank, who's the, you, I was going to thank you for bringing this. It was either, it was one of you two women that brought this up. That was, I think it was you today. And I wrote it down in my, my uh, notes. I said, well, the, the big difference is, um, there are intersexual blind spots. We're obvious of the one, some of them that are obvious. The first of which is, how the hell did she come up with that shit? Right? And, and her looking at you and say, how could you be that naive, stupid, and evil? Right? It's because we work on that time frame spectrum I thought about. And, the, and the, sen the blind spot that Western civilization has is partly natural masculine blind spot. It's partly Christian forgiveness. Christian forgiveness amplified the blind spot to the feminine. It did that for good reason. It did that so that we'll forgive each other for follies and therefore more easily incorporate people into middle class ethics of reciprocity. Right? We won't retaliate against silly things. Why is the left suppressing truth before face? Because they want to restore our are, they want to restore the ability to add insult to injury and seditious undermining. Okay, so I made it to, I made it to intersexual conflict, right? So the, so the big question is, why do are we, be, if it's just that masculinity and, and, um, and uh, Christianity, why are we still such morons? Why do we let this crap go on in front of us? You know, when I, I, when I first studying, uh, studying uh, conservative literature, I thought it was stupid, right? Because it's all this moral stuff that you, that's basically somewhere, it's like the, the format of Christian moral pre preaching with this presumption of aristocratic traditionalism under it, and none of it's clearly stated, and all of it requires you to emotionally and sentimentally agree with them in the first place. I'm like, this is useless. This is, the conservative literature was absolutely useless. So I said, okay, so, so I'm, I'm reading this stuff and I'm saying, but, but that's because they don't even know what they're doing. They only know it's worked and it feels good. So how do we create a science of it? The problem is when you don't know what you're doing, why are we still putting up with this assault on us? This, the, 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 the radical feminine sedition and undermining. And uh, I, I'm, I still don't know the answer. I suspect that um, the, we, the manners we display today, what we would call uh, proper uh, Germanic behavior, which is that we, um, we don't show too much emotion, we l intellectually listen, and then we, uh, then we avoid the creation of sedition and conflict and undermining, right? That's actually imitation of court, of court, uh, court behavior. It moves the court behavior into the, what's called the vulgar behavior of ordinary people. Well, of course, what's the left trying to do? 
They're trying to restore vulgar behavior to and, and the, the aristocratic behavior. But what was the purpose of the aristocratic behavior? Reconciliation of differences and ambitions be, to be, between people who were of had power, especially which power was military. So, <clears throat> so the sedition is actually, I'm trying to get the point across, the sedition's at all levels. Okay, now what have I got to? I've got to them undermining, okay, so we're, we're in the position where we are um, uh, uh, not, for some reason, too tolerant of it. So what happened in the uh, Victorian era of decadence that created the Edwardian era of the prim and proper? The same thing. So did I tell you we've been through cycles before? Yeah. We're in that cycle again. So the next, when we're done, it ought to be the Victorians again. Right, as long as we don't lose. So I made this, so the problem is, why are we vulnerable? If we can solve the how to communicate that problem, we will get it across, but we are vulnerable to it and we tolerate it. We to part of the problem is, I tolerate it from my daughters, from women in the work, in the, I've taught, we tolerate it all the time, right? And you get these effeminate guys that adopt the female behavior and they need, they need a punch in the face, right? And, and we've outlawed punching in the face. So how do you correct people? How do you parent people who you can't discipline? So we have to create the law that allows us to discipline the people who need parenting back into preserving the high capital investment we've made and taking what was er uh, the, the behavior, the Greek aristocratic behavior, the Roman aristocratic behavior, the Germanic aristocratic behavior, the uh, Anglo-French uh, aristocratic behavior, the American aristocratic behavior, which is the ultimate expression of Western civilization in the US Constitution was by Americans. The British got most of the way there, they created the modern state, but the Americans actually made it back to the, in the sovereignty of the individual ma uh, fam man and family. Right? What's the difference between a prohibitive set of laws that prevents the evil and a, and a, and a declarative set of laws that demands the good? Ev, Ev, go ahead. It's more robust. The problem is, if you mandate the good today, you freeze a society in it forever. What happened to India and uh, the Middle East? It, they froze. They, they, they froze solid and then they started uh, declining both politically and genetically. If you look at, at China, China didn't freeze, right? They had, their problem was their state had developed authority rather than law, like we did. So they had more resistance. It required bigger things. What is the most adaptive civilization on the planet, and why? We have a via negativa civilization that empowers the individual to take whatever risk he deems necessary to bring about the good for himself that is also the common good and not a harm to civilization. So from the standpoint of my, our work, my work, it's the fastest evolutionary computation that's possible is the via negativa. So our job is not to create good laws, but prohibit bad behavior, leaving open the field of good behavior so that max, people can pursue the maximum surface area and time and space and opportunity of those things that could be good for individuals in the commons. It promotes innovation, adaptation, and continuous recursive evolution. All right, so now I've laid the ground, have I laid the groundwork for this, this whole thing now? Okay, uh, one of the things that gets confusing is um, uh, once you understand that the, that the logic of the universe is just one thing, continuous recursive disambiguous of entropy into stable relations, right? right? Which is an agreement, stable relations is an agreement between two forces of energy. Right. Once you understand that, and you go back to Chomsky, I brought up Chomsky earlier, my, might have been subconscious association with knowing I was going to say this, but what did Ch Chomsky do with Turing? If you saw Turing's, if, how many nerds in here, computer nerds? Right, so what, is the tur what does a Turing machine do? It's really freaking dumb, right? But it can do back and forth, right? So Chomsky understood Turing, and he said that's what the brain is doing. Continuous recursive disambiguation of disorder into order. We had been thinking for all our history of, of a justificationism, of we're building something. But what's actually happening is the via negativa. We're removing ignorance and ambiguity until we have a parsimonious result. So, um, so instead of calling them logics, which seems to be confused, 
I use the term grammars. Why? Because a grammar is the rules of continuous recursive disambiguation within a paradigm. So the paradigm of arithmetic, the paradigm of mathematics, the paradigm of, the, of algebra, the paradigm of the calculus, uh, the carry, technically the next step is, is, is analysis. Is that the right way to put it? What's above calculus? It explodes in a lot of different yeah, directions. Yeah, but real analysis, complex analysis, yeah, uh, differential geometry, which is what you're a big fan of, the manifolds. Yes. So, um, so the, the point here is that those are all grammars because the rules of what's permissible to talk about in arithmetic are different from the rules that's permissible to talk about in, let's say, um, uh, I love, I'm, what, do you, what did you say, you call it geometry? Well, if geometry, geometry, geometry is how I think of the world because I think in the neurons and constant relations between neurons, which is not a three-dimensional representation. So, um, so a grammar, that's why I use the word grammar, all right? So grammars can be deflationary or inflationary. They can be um, into a system of measurement or a system of meaning. And what's after the system of meaning? The lies, the lies. <laughs> system of deception. How many people have seen my diagram, my uh, chart of the, of the grammars? Oh, less of you than I thought. The grammars is one of those things I think people will be writing PhDs about in the future a lot because once you sort of get it, it's kind of creepy that we're all speaking this one algorithm with different things permitted inside it. All right, so um, what's operational grammar? It's the one that says complete actions that are subjectively testable mentally or physically by the human mind. And that includes using instrumentation to collect additional things that are additional information that's reducible to it. So the difference here is that what's the density of information that can be put in arithmetic? It's counting in positional names. What's the definition, that, the, the density of things that can put in operational grammar if it's whether mental, physical, or instrumentational? Well, it's anything. We, we, if we can't do that thing, we can't think of it. What's well, a logic? It's a set of constant relations between properties that are uh, reducible to analogy experience, meaning if we can't compare it in our minds, we can't determine it. So why do they, does the left use a lot of um, verbal manipulation, verb, uh, word pollution, meaning changes, and uh, conflationary language? Because they don't want it to be testable. They want it to be emotionally, empathically intuitable, but they don't want it to be testable. What is sophistry? If you're losing anything to create the impression you're making a logical connection that isn't logical. It, it, the basic way to do this is make somebody say it without the word is, are, was, were, and you'll say, okay, you, can't, you don't actually know what you're saying, because the is is the, way, the primary way of lying. Then we get into, after we get into sophistry, we get into fictionalisms. Your magic to pseudoscience, sophistry to idealism, which is philosophy, imaginary, which is a cult of supernaturalism, and we, these all convey a pretense of knowledge that doesn't exist. This is how men lie. Men lie by systemization. So when you realize that's the history of the evolution of Western thought, is how can I lie about something so that I can pretend I know something I don't, right? It, it, it's depressing, but it is, it, so we, once you look at it, once you, we started working on uh, the sex differences lying, it, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between how men and women lie. And it's, the, it's, and it's basically an attempt to create a false truth, and the women's is to try to create truth about which is preferable, right? Instead of, they conflate truth and preference. Right? So, if it's, so if you're talking to a woman, what's good is what's true. What's preferable is what's true. What's bad is what's false. And you're like, that makes no goddamn sense, but you're not a woman. Excuse me, you're not cognitively feminine. Did I do it right that time? So what is pilpul? Um, in the Jewish language, it, they say it is looking at all sides of a problem. What is it really? It's an attempt to circumvent truth and achieve an equality, an agreement, rather than inconsistency, correspondence, and, and, and causality. What is critique? Right? You, when I was in school, critique meant when you went to a class, and you sat for three hours, and they showed paintings, sculpture, architecture, craft products, literature, dance, plays, and you said, okay, 
uh, what's good and bad about this in the context of the historical development of arts as technologies and for the conveyance of both um, uh, uh, high investment, which is the material competency and material product and the wealth, and uh, the, the, uh, mor what you consider the moral content of the civilization, the civilization's group evolutionary strategy. Right, the cultural content of it. And so that's what I was taught. But what do they mean, what does the left mean critique is? It means undermining. So there, the point of I'm trying to get to this is there's male, male European may, ways of pretense of knowledge, right? By sort of, by, by trying to convince you that the truth is, is what they're saying by pseudological means. And then there's the Semitic me method, which is pill, pull, and critique, which is the positiva and the negativa, right? Positiva and negativa to get, to, to get you to undermine the truth so that you can get to agreement on emotions or satisfaction independent of the effect on the commons, right? That's the whole point, independent of the effect on commons. The externalization of uh, the privatization of gains and the socialization of losses. That's what these things are for. So how do I amplify the use of this and this to obtain what we want without contributing to production? It's important. They're not contributing production. If I make a thing, if I have farmers and craftsmen and engineers and, and things, I'm, we're producing, right? But what are they trying to do? They're not trying to produce. Extract. They're trying to extract. So it consists of undermining truth, reason, probability, and evidence by use of false promise, baiting into hazard, pill pull in the positiva, critique in the negativa, straw manning, heaping of undue praise. This is why they use the names of authors instead of the names of ideas. In the West, we use the name of an idea. We might name an idea after an author, but we don't claim the author is uh, brilliant. Right? We say, you're responsible for this technological innovation, actually. That's not what they do. They create a hero out of someone. So they heap undue praise. If you want to know, how, I mean, libertarianism, this is what they do. They heap undue praise on tertiary and quaternary contributors to economics in order to claim that those people have more legitimacy and influence and contribution than they said. The left does the same thing. They would, they'll heap on, they'll heap praise on Marcusa, for example, right? Or, or uh, let me think of another one. Uh, they'll, 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 they'll heap praise on these people. And when they're actually evil. And so they're trying to create a sentimental relationship, an association, without the ability to test for falsification. If you actually said there what their idea was, if the left actually spoke of their ideas in open language and their ambitions, I'm like, what are you kidding? I'm, I'm not going to, how am I going to agree to that? Um, and then they use propagation into social construction. In other words, the use of verbal acuity and gossip, shaming, rallying, moralizing. To use suggestion and overloading to force individuals, groups, and polities to appeal to, to their intuitions rather than reason and evidence. What does, the conserve, what does the European tradition do? Tries you to ignore your emotions and appeal to reason and evidence. In other words, we're trying to make you learn. What are they trying to make you do? They're trying to make you a victim. And so uh, it's the same techniques by faith healers, priests, and con artists. And the higher the group's trust, the more susceptible we are to it. Who's the highest trust population, aside from the Japanese? Well, Europeans. I would just add one thing. It's more than extraction. They consume. They consume that value like a vampire would. So it's a form of theft. No, no, I, I agree. Uh, that, that's true. Uh, extraction, uh, we mean it, is an involuntary transfer of an asset. All right. So they use common tactics. Who asked me about mythicism the other day? I was talking about mythicism to some of you guys? Yeah, it was you, right? So they use myth as history. Now, what is, what is the difference between measurement, which is testimony, in, uh, conflation, inflation, fictionalism, and fiction? 
So basically what it means is you're, you're adding more and more variables that can, over, that can load frame and overload the person to prevent them from, un, from rationally understanding what's actually happening. And, how, you, know, you know the de debate today about how they're not sure what's going on inside neural networks? Right, we've been saying this for, does anybody know this or not? Right, so inside a neural network, uh, because of the way the data is stored, the, the information is stored, the, it's all relationships between information. It's actually very hard to figure out what the heck's going on in there. Well, somebody did some of this the other day and they did some really great stuff and it, of course it turns out to be the same thing our brain does. The problem is can you, you can't int what's called introspect on a neural network. You can't trace anything. Can you introspect on why you come to a conclusion? Or does it just appear as a feeling, an intuition, or an instinct? It's only once it has that you understand it rationally. So what they're doing is they're bypassing by suggestion, by influence, by loading, framing, overloading, obscuring, etc. They're going by your ability to rationally accept. Now, for guys like us, we're disagreeable. Do we care that, we, other, people, that, we, that other people agree with us? Not at all. But what does the empathic mind do, agreeable empathic mind do? They go along with it. They don't even question it. That's why we tend to accumulate knowledge on our own, and they tend to accumulate knowledge from others. So they started this myth as history. They project wisdom as law. They use dependence on supernaturalism, or uh, which is a supernatural authority, pseudoscience in the case of, of um, um, the Marxist sequence, um, and um, sophistry and fictionalism in the case of the Frankfurt School, and um, uh, utter falsehoods in the case of anti-male feminism. So then they make a false promise to get your attention. So they say bait, right? They depend on this. They deny all the other alternatives. They, said they critique and undermine the alternatives. They issue a false promise of a reward for your compliance with it. They use pill pull in the positiva and critique uh, in defense of their falsehoods. They develop casts of professional liars and they uh, give them, uh, they use, they propagandize them, giving them status. They compensate them, giving them power and they provide incentives to continue to do so to perpetuate those falsehoods. This is the academy. It's an, if, if we took away funding for left-based research, would there be any? We've known this forever. We just can't get, we can't get it through. They claim they have secret knowledge on knowledge or prohibition on competing knowledge. They, they take an oath to a falsehood and they make people pay ritualistic costs to the falsehood. Right? So does this sound like a cult? Oh, yes. I mean, we've got a guy who's the master of, under, of reforming cultists here in the back of the room. This is a cult, right? Oh, yes. So, um, it's, it's the most highly engineered cult in the history of humanity. So one of the things you know about, you learn about humans quickly easy about cults, is the higher the cost to stay, the, less re, the, le, the more resistance to departure. I would take it this way, I would say, we know the name of the devil, his name was Abraham and he was from Ur. Right? If you want to go metaphysical or uh, supernatural, there is a devil, he invented the institutionalization of lying. Well, I put Satan in my slide. Yep. So the question is, I, I tried to make the point yesterday in somebody's, in Martin's talk, was that the Jews were baited into the hazard of parasitism by the Egyptians, so the Egyptians could use them against the uh, people of the region to administer and tax. And they went and spread that technique, that use to, of allying with the state against the people wherever they went. They work on profiting from civilizational destruction within, uh, instigating construction of internal spirals of capital destruction. Mean, and I remember, our, we use the term capital to talk about the entire spectrum from information to genetic. Right? They bait people into hazard with a false promise. 
They take advantage of the bottom, those people who are ignorant or lack agency. They use that fa false promise to circumvent the feedback loop of reality by saturating people in social constructions, unfortunately, which is which w women are most vulnerable to. They're under the, or f the feminine mind is most vulnerable to. God, I hope you guys will correct me on that. Um, under the persuasion by sophism, justified by critique under the cover of moral pretense. They actually claim they're doing good. They under cover of plausible deniability, but it's, we're doing good, or, but it's our religion. The big problem I had with the, 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 for the, from about 2017 to 2019, the big, maybe 2020, the big struggle I had is you can't outlaw Christianity, right? Because it's, the problem is that the Jesus figure is actually valuable, but the, 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 the Abrahamic content is evil. So you can't get rid of it. It's hard to get rid of it. Um, and they do it for the purpose of profiting by harm from the consumption of accumulated capital by undermining, by undermining truth, reason, delay of gratification, manners, ethics, morals, traditions, cooperation between classes, the organization and the organization of classes by not specializing in, not by, this is what they're not doing, production and innovation in goods, services, information, both private and common, that are warranted. In other words, they're not going to hurt the individual or the commons. They're not going to privatize the commons or externalize losses. They're not going to cause involuntary ta transfer. They're not going to bait people into hazard. And absent the warranty, which if they gave the warranty, that's why libertarians don't recognize fraud. In other words, libertarians say you ha in order to commit fraud, you have to agree not to commit fraud. So they do it by gossip for undermining. Now, this is the news in the media, right? They do it for information destruction in the academy, government uh, facilitation of conflict, legislation undermines by facilitation of conflict, facilitating dissolution of norms, traditions, manners, ethics, morals, by bringing about parasitism and, and capital exhaustion. They, do, they use rent-seeking of special interests, ADL. They use corruption of influence. They undermine the law by specialization in the constitution by the courts. In other words, they're the ones that commit lawfare. They uh, specialize in those things that are non-productive and maximize the capacity for destruction of civilizational capital. Law, specialization, coercion. Finance, specialization of, in uh, baiting into hazard and parasitism. Tax, tax, taxing and accounting, specialization of evasion and extraction and involuntary transfer. Marketing and advertising, specialization in false promise. Sales scams, events. You gotta know this, but you know the Ginsu knife commercials? You know who designed that software for selling that, those, those uh, ads? Me. I hated those people after about six months so much. I, I was sitting there, how could we kill them all? Um, they do commercial trade scams and the physical service information. They do black market check cashing, loan sharking, gambling, pornography, prostitution, drug dealing. Right. So they do all the baiting into hazard. If you look at the wealthiest people in this country, and you divide, you look at their their ethnic background. The white people did it in construction, or production, and the Jews did it in financialization and the assistance with the government in producing uh, rental properties or something of that nature. So they specialize in this. Now, the person who does the greatest, Solzhenitsyn does the greatest job of explaining how Russians gave the Jews property to farm. They wouldn't do it. What did they do? They went back to selling alcohol, prostitution, and gambling on credit. The idea isn't the alcohol, the right. They're trying to prevent, provoke degeneracy in order to bait you into the hazard of a debt to them, which they can then use to seize your assets. The Jews will say, well, you guys wouldn't let us own property. No, we wouldn't let you repossess property. All right. So what they're trying to do is generate conflict, destroying trust, dis dis generating demand for restitution, generating demand for authority, an authority that recursively issues, a, this is what I'm saying is, what's the, what, reparations? That's what they're doing. They're making this happen, right? So they're trying to create themselves an authority that recursively issues another iteration of false promise baiting into hazard, causing a continuous spi conflict spiral. Now, Scott Adams has contributed one one of my favorite means of lying to the, the to the um, to the my list of the ways they lie, and the way the list of, and it's called um, rolling accusations, and this is what this is. 
is they cause a continuous conflict spiral by making, using, making a false accusation or a specious accusation, you popularizing it, and then keeping it popular until it's disproven, in other words, that it was false, and, invent, and as soon as that happens, creating a new false accusation. And so what they're doing is reputation destruction by sequences of false accusations that are later confirmed to be false by the use of environmental saturation. Now, in my business with marketing, technology, marketing, advertising, I'm keenly aware that it's basically you have to create legitimacy by the presence of an idea in, a, in, a, in, in space and time. So what you'd really do is you're just trying to get your Winston cigarettes out there in enough places that people have a vague association with it and that by, by social construction, by, by visible presence, then it's legitimate. That's all they're doing. They're and you know how many people fall for that in media crap? So one of the, I said, I would love to be a press, a press secretary because I would just document, I would have the press, press room lined with, lined with televisions that showed the lie cycle of all the news media and who was participating in the lie and see how that affect and then talk about it with it as the beginning of every press conference calling them all liars the next thing i would do is i take our uh, this work i would make posters on the wall of how they lie and i would go over so i would have a little pointer like this one i would have a pointer like this is that the lie you're telling <laughs> I mean, because I you wouldn't have any job to do as a press secretary except answer the few on the one or two honest questions. What does the president think about this? That's what the press secretary is supposed to do, right? The president holds this position. Here's his platform. Here's his position. In this particular case, he's holding this position, and this is where they, they don't tell you the truth, as Trump did. He says, "I don't want to talk about that because it gives away my negotiating position." You just, can you say that openly? Yes. Okay, I'm not going to talk about it because it gives away my negotiation position, right? That's a truthful statement. But what do they do instead? They lie. So if you were to, if you were to actually run the press conference, the, 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 the room like that, what would happen to the public's awareness of what was going on? Well, it would go up incredibly. And we need like five posters to show this stuff, right? I might not show you way more than that today, but... Um, where, was, where did I leave off? Continuous complex, well, the tragedy of the commons, conflict for consumption until all. So what happens is, is that if nobody believes there's capital going to be preserved in the commons, everybody re accelerates their interest in consuming the commons. It's a bank run, and that's how the tragedy of the commons is. Until so all genetic, cultural, normative, artistic, economic, institutional, political uh, uh, capital has been, has been destroyed or consumed. And they do that by fostering the destroying trust, by the fostering the conflict between the classes and interests, and by expansion of the underclass whose numbers, invasion, reproduction, consumption, agitation has been previously limited by the institutions of productivity, private meritocracy, market law, natural aristocracy, and the surplus proceeds from that production devoted to the production of commons, providing the asymmetric return on those commons that has lifted the West out of uh, out faster than all other civilizations combined in a shorter time period. So is, does that sound like a recipe for evil? That's what they're doing, right? How hard was it to, decom to decompose it into that? It took me years. Oh. What? Can, I make, can I make a comment real quick here? Please do. It, it struck me while you were... I was just trying to make my arc complete. Just to make sure. Go ahead. It's on. It, it struck me while you were talking that you, th what you're describing is the... Uh, undermining of the alternative forms of conflict resolution to violence. Yes. So then any group that self-imposes restraint and violence for conflict resolution becomes a target Correct. for that group. When I say, why didn't I take the bait in Richmond? Because we're dominant masculine right. and we saw by force, instead of what we did, which was say, hey, come hang out, whatever, and right. then just go on right. and we can continue with our message. Because yeah. if you don't take the bait, they're powerless. We had, to, we had to stop taking violence off the table. We don't have to use it, but we have to stop taking it off the table. Correct. Why do we like quick resolution? Why do we use violence? Quick resolution, right? Why do we use force? Quick resolution. What is the most truthful, clear if it's remember violence is a resource that can be uh, morally immorally if we're applying it morally what is the fastest way to bring about resolution violence. right 
What's the problem when you face an enemy who baits you into violence while continually undermining you? Right? The problem is you have to figure out a way to solve that problem. The best way to do it, of course, is to not use violence on the idiots and to only use violence on the things that need to be, ca what do you call it, ca conquered. The things that need to be conquered in order so that you can retain control. I'm just trying to see if there's any, I was looking at this as I've met, I've done truthful grammars. I've done, done the deceits and their failures of due diligence. I've talked about this fictionalisms. Um, I haven't talked about avoidance, which is how another way of lying. So you can, you can lie by evasion. You can lie by denial. So we've had the Abrahamic evolution, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, although Martin and I might disagree on the order. We got the dark age of theology. We had the industrial revolution, which, which uh, brought about a, a, a rapid change. So you have Marxism, postmodernism, feminism, denialism, and all the other stuff that goes along with it. So the long cycle of history is the male evolutionary territorial Fast, scientific, Western, medium, rational, Eastern, slow, native, narrative, uh, Indian, and female devolutionary migratory, supernatural, Semitic, counter-evolving strategy with Africa, Americas, and the Pacific lagging, and it appears uh, Australia, New Zealand actually went backwards. So the people, the people from Australia actually lost fire for a while. Um, so we have this, can you scroll all the way up to why evolution? So... Um, Judaism against Babylon's Christianity against Western aristocracy, Islam against the ancient world's aristocracy, really tribal leaders, Marxism against the world, modern world's aristocracy, French postmodernism against the current world's aristocracy, Islam against the entire world's aristocracy, Abrahamism is a grammar of devolutionary deceit. It's not just that it's immoral, it's not just that it's criminal, it's actually catastrophically de devolutionary, not only culturally but genetically. So all three Abrahamic religions, Kantian philosophy, Marxist argument, and postmodern thought all make use of this technique of argument, often stated as dialectically, but operationally it consists of pill-pull and critique. So most of our work is that consists of attempts to prevent these arguments and replace them with uh, testimonial arguments so that laws can be constructed uh, strictly and logically and not open to their deceits. I mean, the hard part of my work is how do you, with that... Ad that method, I think this is the next slide, the, that method of lying is as sophisticated in lying as Western's, Western philosophy, lo, empiricism, logic, and science are. It's a very sophisticated, we can't think about it as just the silliness. It's a sophistic logic of deception and destruction. It's the aircraft carrier of lies. It is. It's freaking evil. Um, so... Uh, so all we're trying to do is produce the means of prohibiting it. If we prohibit it, we would like to do what law demands, is restitution, punishment, and prevention. Um, I'd be really up into the punishment side. I think most of the people would be interested in the restitution side. But I've definitely got the prevention side down if we get the power to enact it. Yeah. This is uh, Indo-European paganism, Zoroastrianism, Abraham... Uh, rabbinical Judaism and Peter and Paul. We get out of this the pseudoscience of Bose, Freud, Marx, the Frankfurt School, Mises and Rothbard, and Hollywood. I had to put Hollywood in there. Over here we got uh, the Greek religions, Plato, Neoplatonism. Uh, we got Gnosticism, was Manichaeism. We got Aristotle, Mr. Sin and anyway, out of all that we get Aquinas, we get uh, Protestantism, we get Neo-Puritanism, and we get the 20th century uh, Reformation. The problem is, these are all reactionary. Every one of these is an anti-aristocratic male responsibility movement. What's the difference between sexes? Risk tolerance for conflict that's produced by taking responsibility for the construction, preservation, and use of capital. Abrahamism, the most advanced form of lying. Th that's another t-shirt. That's another t-shirt. All right, so what I want to show you is, you see this? This is a book. This is the book I, ha I don't talk about. <laughs> what will disturb you is, 
what you go through is how much of it's done. Because that would compromise your negotiation. Correct, exactly. <laughs> wait, wait, should we take this part out of recording? No. As I said, it's time, so it's time. The great filter. Given the age of the universe, the long time for advanced life to emerge, a short time for technology to emerge from it, the absence of life and the observable universe, there must be one or more barriers to advanced stellar, interstellar, galactic, and intergalactic life that prevents abiogenesis, multicellular life, tool using, abstract intelligence, technological innovation, and colonization. Well, I mean, in the short window we've been looking at the universe, for the short distance we've been looking at it, we don't know that, but it's a great thing to think about because it's not like we have neighbors, planetary neighbors that are, that are detectable within range. Um, even if that, the problem is if there's a great filter, that means a lot of evo groups evolve and die off before they get gain interstellar or galactic transport. So the problem I have is that, guess what I think the, the great filter is? The left. The left. If you can't overcome that, this is why I'm worried about, uh, I, they, they killed the eugenics movement, but the eugenics movement was actually the way to get through the great filter. Because you, once you have a population that's repro asymmetrically reproducing, that's producing increasingly devolutionary numbers, well, especially when you realize that the rate of decline of a capacity, logical capacity under 105 is not linear. Well, but it's the, that's the problem. Now, if you take, People who are only from, ni from, from 95 to 115, which we call the midwits, um, if you take them and you give them an education, you can prevent them from being harmful. But what happens if you take them and you give them maleducation? Now you've not only taken the people who are incompetent, and you've mattified them, the people who think they're competent and actually harmful. So we don't know our group strategies, right? I mean, I covered this yesterday. There are a limited number of them. This is what's interesting. I showed you this anchoring sequence of civilizations yesterday, right? There's a path dependency, whether which, which formal institution you develop first. So you're anchored by whatever you start, but it turns out that all surviving strategies succeeded. Some are moral, some are immoral. You got moral, which is most of them, immoral, which is like uh, gypsies and Jews and Islam. And they either advance uh, or hinder um, or, or uh, evolve or regress man. They aren't equal or relative of subjective, but it's just physics at scale. There's no difference between what happens to people over time and the physical universe over time. You're either increasing the capacity to develop energy in a correspondence to the individual or you're not. So right now we're going through another axial age. Who knows what the axial age is? The axial age is the time after the Bronze Age collapse where trade uh, was reestablished, contact between civilizations was reestablished, and the Greeks invented money, which created the need for these religions to create homogenous rule systems be before it was possible to put what we would call formal legal systems into place. We're midway through a new axial age. So this is our group evolutionary strategy. Um, it's consistent, right? What is it? It's a universal militia maximizing speed, maneuver, adaptation, innovation, the continuous domestication of agency through self-determination, sovereignty, reciprocity, oath and truth before face, dependent on meritocracy, absent authority, leaving only adversarialism as a means of decidability, voting for production of commons, rule of all for the dispute resolution, and markets for the production of goods, services, and information the necessary, and the necessity of governing those with less agency and culling those who lack agency by natural market selection, producing a civilization with the greatest conformity, discovery, of adaptation to an implication of the formal, physical, natural, and evolutionary laws of the universe. We're, com we're an excellent piece algorithm. The Chinese have an advantage is they have IQ points. It's more, it's more important, it's more important you don't have a bottom than it does you have more at the top. There's our whole thing. The Jewish group evolutionary strategy, which is where I'm trying to get to. All right, so you have our origi origins are territorial and political control, right? They had lack of territorial and political control. They couldn't hold their territory. Why? Geo geopolitics. It's too hard to defend. That's correct. These are northern hunter-gatherers, Anatolian farmers, and European steppe herders. 
They had initial uh, entrepreneurialism, low clannishness, metal smithing technology, domestication of horse and man, and primacy of man. So the, uh, the point here is that when the Europeans, the, the, early, the early step herders, went into Europe and conquered Europe, and they, they, they took what they call slaves, well, they were treating them as another domesticated animal. This stuck with Europeans for a long time, right? I mean, Aristotle talks about it, talks about other races as if they're domesticated animals, right? Um, whereas they came from old world pastorists, right? Uh, they were high clannishness, they learned writing by the Egyptians, they had theology, they had state failure, and they had resentment of the primacy of uh, gods. We had bilateral kinship. In other words, we respected the maternal line as the, and the paternal line. That's why we have fairly highfalutin women in burial graves. Um, they have unilin or at least sort of strongly paternal, paternalistic. Um, they are, so we have a simple household and they have extended family and joint households. We had exogamous mon uh, uh, monogamous relationships. They had en endogamous, consanguinous, and polygynous. They, Jews didn't stop serial marriage. I say, it, it, I, I like to pick on the Irish because I love them. The Irish didn't stop serial marriage until the 1800s. Uh, the Jews didn't stop it till the 1500s. Um, so you could, ha so that's why, there's another reason for this, the inbreeding issue, is because a woman would have children with multiple men. Um, the position of women is high versus low. And the social structure, it's individualistic versus collectivistic. The socialization is uh, the stresses of independence and self-reliance and the stresses of in-group identification and obligations to kinship group. What happens if you're uh, rejected in, you, in well, you guys probably can't imagine this, but if what you're rejected in old Europe is your neighbor, no matter what, is some distant relation. Right? They're not aliens, right? They're not different. I mean, Germans, Germanic doesn't have a name for the equivalent of others. It's only got brothers, right? Um, uh, so socialization is that you need to, to stay alive when you're surrounded by tribalism from people who are from the intersection of different continents and who are moving around a lot. Um, you get uh, you need in-group association more dependent than you than any other group. So we, if you look in Europe, if you look, what's the girl, the bog body, not the bog, the Danish girl, uh, buried her in a log, but the log for some reason kept it kept everything intact. So we actually have her clothes. So there's a big bronze buckle, uh, one of those knot skirt things, and a knot skirt, knot top. And so, but she was from hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So we were moving people around and trading mates and stuff all over the place. Why? Because what's the marginal difference among Europeans versus the marginal difference between North Africans, uh, South Arabians, uh, the hill people in Iran, and the people uh, in what we would call Pakistan, the Indus today, and the people in the north area above that that are continually the Turks, the people were in the Caucasus, and the people were in Anatolia. There's a big difference become because each of those groups was before this admixture was speciating. That's why there's, it's so easy to tell what groups people are from, and which I have a great diagram of, I've done of all the, all the of ethnic evolution. So there was a, they were self-directed by deliberate choice and political marketplace, but socially constructed into social. We did altruistic punishment. They had the threat of, threat of ostracization. Um, we had reason and science, and they had dogmatism. The primary driver I'm trying to get here is the dependence on the in-group for survival, the difference between the dependence and the gr group for survival in the Middle East, which is still tribal, versus Europe. Um, they had neutral judiciary between military, economy, and faith, which is judiciary, and rule by judiciary. They, I think I covered this last night, but they use mythicism, which is they take all the trifunctions and put them into religion. That's what the Middle East does, while we retain the judicial, the law, the, 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 the traditional law, the uh, military, and the faith as three, or the, the priests, as three different elites that compete with each other over domains. Um, there, we are scientific and transactional, and there's sophistic and reinterpretation. They, we force continuous adaptation. They prohibit adaptation, and they're maladaptive, devolutionary, primogenia. That doesn't mean that they're not going to evolve eugenically. 
right? Because they've, so once they get rabbinical Judaism, they're selecting for upward transformation of reproduction. What happened in Europe? We sent our first sons of the aristocracy, uh, secondary sons of the aristocracy to the church where they didn't reproduce, or at least legitimately reproduce, very often. So we constrained the population of aristocracy in Europe to under a half million people. What did they do? They basically tried to create a whole population of them. What did China do? They took everybody they could get that could pass a test and converted them into the leadership caste. Again, argumentative method. We're, we're about truth. What are they about? Agreement. We have trifunctionalism. They have a monopoly. We have productivity. They have parasitism. We have physical warfare. They have sedition warfare. We make military alliances. They make political, social, and economic clientelism. We use physical borders. They use signal borders. We have um, um, moral universalism. They have moral particularism. This is what makes people mad about them. This is the thing that gets them in trouble. Uh, we, have at low, we have the lowest ethnocentrism, what we're called the most racist. They have, they have, the, they have hyper ethnocentrism, which is one of the highest. Um, we have relatively low xenophobia, and they're very high. One of my best friends, I think I make a video, is in, in Connecticut, my best friend is a, one of the big red haired Jewish guys that works in the financial sector. Right? And he's got this little Turkish girl as his, as his girl who's Muslim. And she is a hot bucket. I can't imagine what his mother says. All right. And she's Russian Jewish, too. Um, so I was trying to show that, that we had uh, very opposite masculine and feminine gr group strategies. And they're not, they're intuitionistic. We, we don't have to know them. We have to just practice them. Understanding their group tactics. Technically speaking, the Jews and Muslims hide behind special pleading, the pretense of innocence, pretense of victimhood, and the plausible deniability for race, for religion, and for past justified persecutions, while they practice warfare within by treason, the priority of external loyalty, sedition, undermining from within, rather than warfare by clear, truthful, physical violence, conduct their war against the informational, social, political, economic institutions by evasion, using gossiping, shaming, rally, outraging, rallying, moralizing, psychologizing, loading, framing, false and exaggerated accusation to undermine rather than offer um, competing alternatives and using critique to undermine uh, and then using social construction, pill pull, fictionalism, pseudoscience, idealism, supernaturalism, baiting to hazards, seduction, enticement, entrapment, using historical obscurantism and, re and revisionism, disinformation, false promise of freedom from probability, determining scarcity, self-interest, reciprocity, kin selection, regression of the mean, genetic load, and natural selection. That's dysgenia, right? And financial warfare, concentration of incentives, to produce concentration of force, legal contrivance, exploiting our unique European tolerance, using conspiracy to profit from war within against European peoples who uniquely and falsely, which is what I was trying to get uh, Luke to talk about, we uniquely and falsely conceive of warfare as limited to physical conflict. In other words, we domesticated warfare. What's the Westphalian peace? Anybody know what that is? Who can tell me about the Westphalian peace? Basically, restricting warfare between state and state. Restricting warfare to the resolution of differences between states and protecting the interests of the people. Because what are they, what are they really? The aristocracy is entrepreneurs. They don't want the capital destroyed. So we domesticated warfare. What is human rights? The domestication of warfare. What is the most war policy? The main states maintain within their borders and produce economic development under the banner of human rights domestication of warfare. We've domesticated warfare. Who else has? Nobody. What, matter of fact, what are Judaism and Islam? They, they make warfare domestic. They, okay, that's great. That's really, they're means of warfare. So they exploit our your unique European tolerance for adversarial ideas within the law, this is the point we're trying to fix, using all those tr tricks. So we're trying to make sure that there we close this ability to exploit our tolerance for via adversarials within the law by clarifying the law to prohibit those adversarials. So I won't go over all this, but we know the long history of Jews profiting from harm, slavery, 
um, working with the state against the people uh, using baiting into hazard to get people into credit so they can seize assets and enslave, basically enslave them virtually. Um, uh, we know we've talked about their baiting into hazard. We know that both the both Christianity originally as well as the Marxist sequence are all baiting people who don't who aren't us into uh, the hazard. And if you don't know what a hazard is, an unlawful game of dice. That's where the word comes from. Is baiting people into a hazard. Right? Baiting people into an unlawful game of dice. Uh, was any chance of game of war wagering. So I'm in the. I know a lot about the advertising business, right? So, and what what is advertising? It's gambling. But what is financial investment? It's gambling. What are drugs? Gambling. But what is prostitution? What is gambling? You're baiting people into the hazard. So they specialize in those things that bait people into hazard. What is loan sharking? It's baiting into hazard. It's chance. So the problem is, in the West, we leave that, the choice of chance to you. Well, that's because we wouldn't do this shit to each other. But they do. So, because we consider that on immoral occupations. But they don't consider them immoral occupations. What they do is bait people into hazard and professionalize the extraction of goods from people without the contribution to production. So when you ask me why I define reciprocity as productive, uh, fully informed, voluntary transfer of demonstrated interest, free of uh, extra, uh, imposition of costs upon the demonstrated interests of others by externality and within the limits of warranty and liability. What am, what am I trying to fix there? I'm trying to say that it has to be productive. If you, uh, and you prohibit the unproductive, you get rid of baiting into ha most baiting into hazard, yeah. And also in gambling, the house always has an edge. If calculated, they're always going to win. Right, but you know that going in. But the people that are baited in a hazard... They don't know they, they, they go. Don't know they don't know that so they're... So you, you create an industry where you know you have an edge based on the vice of others, mm -hmm. and you're going to want to expand that as much as possible. Now wait until... Now make, it, now make it so that you can collect all those fees and the U.S. government ensures your bad investments. Exactly. So that's creating a hazard. So scroll down to this. What's a moral hazard? The party with more information about its actions or atten intentions has a tendency or incentive to behave against the interests of the other party with less information. So th well, that's what you just said, right? Which is that if, the, if you don't know that the likelihood of you failing at this is fairly high, or if you are vulnerable because of your situation, to be baited into a hazard in extent to escape temporary relief in exchange for the higher risk of worse conditions in the future. That's moral hazard. Uh, lack of incentive to guard against risk. Uh, in insurance, it's the probability an event may happen. On uh, fire insurance, in economics, in tort law, in, in politics. It's the examples, all right? So this, I just went through the list of their common crimes and I listed them. Entice you into buying goods. I'm baiting you into hazards since addiction is a spiral. If I have to lend you money, extend you credit to buy alcohol or drugs, creating a vicious cycle. If I suggest you might win at gambling, you can't bait and, and do it on credit, then I've baited you into the hazard of continuous debt. If I lend you money or extend you credit to gamble, bookies. If I lend you money at usurious prices that will entrap you into debt cycles, loan sharking. Student loan debt is baiting into a hazard because what's happening is that um, if we, one of the things that we actually covered this, one of the biggest reforms we've written is the university system. Um, which is that, you know, who, they basically hire temp professors so they can hire more administrators. I know. And they're not providing value to the students. Would creating the Federal Reserve also be a baiting in a hazard? The Federal Reserve baits the, ba the bad people into higher hazards. In other words, it gives them the opportunity to hazard themselves. So what the Federal Reserve does is it makes it e too easy for you to take all the profits that's returned. <coughs> However, if the, I instead you said you were buying shares from the government, right? And the, or the share, you were saying the shares, you were getting cash from the government in the form of basically shares, and the government got shares back, right? And so the shares were proportioned to the people, and, right? Then it would be an income on Gates. 
it wouldn't be this credit expansionary nonsense. So yes. It's, still, why would you need a third party to do that if it was the power to the Congress? Why would you, that that's, well, I'm making that, I agree with you. That's, that, that's the next step, is you don't need anything but a treasury. I think a third party is like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so you look at who buys the government, that's who. So if I lend you money as user as prices, if I offer you to get a loan uh, under duress, but I can extract interest from and seize your property and restitution, if I promise you life after death, if I promise you salvation in heaven, um, if, I found, um, if you rebel against there, if I promise you power and equality, if I promise you equality, if you undermine men, if I promise you status, if you undermine the status hierarchy, if I appeal to your morality and pass the Heart Seller Immigration Act, if I promise you equality or socialism when it's genetics that causes our differences, you act to destroy, right? If I promise you the end of whiteness, which is what they're really promising now, right? In other words, you're entering into a voluntary exchange for the, that is not in your interest simply because for whatever reason you are vulnerable to the trap these are all lies that bait you into hazard. So the, deals with the devil. So the, this is the weakness in Western civilization, is we grant people sovereignty to do stupid things. Right? That's the problem. Did it matter when you had no money? No. But everybody's got money today, everybody's got property today because of the Industrial Revolution, so it matters a lot more. So we have to take away the, the, uh, the capacity to, uh, to recover losses that were when, when baiting into hazard was used. You know, if you think of the credit card debt most young people are put into. Why is that okay? I mean, the answer with the credit cards is, if people can't pay you, you lost it. What's interesting is very hard for them to develop organizations. The Middle East can't produce a government, a, a major corporation, a corporation, or a military. And the reason is because you can't trust anybody to do anything. Don't they consider distrust a form of games? Uh, they consider it as honorable. They, can, they perceive cheating. This is the, we're, a, we're a truth before face. China, East Asia is a face before truth. The difference is they actually know the difference, right? They're just preserving face as a means of respect. And if you're actually clued in, you would understand that's what they're doing, right? Um, the problem in their civilization is it's hard to raise objections. When I, go to, when I went to Ukraine and Russia, the biggest problem I had is, I'm the CEO, don't let me fuck up. They can't even imagine that someone would ask this. They can't imagine it. It takes me six months to get a developer there to tell me, that's a bad idea, I'm not gonna write that. Kurt, wouldn't you say they consider goodness is stupid, silly? Yes. Yeah. Russians actually, are, they consider our, our uh, optimism to be, to be naivety. What it does is it slows the Oodle loop down. Yes, right. We cannot give honest feedback, and so we can evolve a thousand years in ten. Or we can evolve in ten years, what takes them a thousand. That's right. Run that so basically, what they've developed is a system. Is a, so the, the gypsies are an organized crime family, but their crimes are petty. So, but over, the, but it, it used to be that if you wanted a new roof on your house, you waited until the gypsies were around, and they did it for a quarter of the price of anybody else. They probably stole something in your yard, but it's probably cheaper, right? <laughs> um, they also had prostitutes, which would come there. Right, and they probably had alcohol you couldn't get for a lower price. So there was a, they, you know, the reason people didn't kill them, they were bad, but they weren't bad enough. Right, so um, basically they, or, they run as an organized crime family. It's a black market system to produce organized crime for to produce extractions without contribution to production. So the Jews are desperate to maintain their parasitic means of existence and competence at productivity, innovation, producing commons or polys. Why are, the, despite Jews being the lowest literate people in Europe, for, for over a thousand years, did they achieve nothing except organized crime? There were there any arts? Were there any letters? Engineering? Was there any science? Nothing. You know why they got into the sciences? Because we held them out of it so long, and they got so envious of it, they went into it. 
So it's, they create an organized crime family for 2,000 years until t tolerated by Europeans in the Industrial Revolution, at which point they immediately invented a counter-revolution against evolutionary superiority of Western civilization, the Marxist sequence, just as they had in the Jewish, Christian, Muslim revolutions against the superior evolutionary civilizations of the ancient world. They specialize in industries of unaccountable, unproductive, parasitic, baiting into hazard, profiting from others' loss, profiting from the destruction of high trust commons and the pretense of plausible deniability. They sell signal goods, gambling, prostitution, Institution, alcohol, drugs on credit, organized black market crime, money changing, entrapment and loan sharking, entrapment by usurious credit, entrapment by default and takings, entrapment by slavery, slaving host, uh, slaving host peoples, entrapment in political policy, entrapment into service of the state, entrapment by alliance with the state against the people, fraudulent tax farming, the purchase of product of institutions, converting them to rent seeking institutions, nepotistic conspiracy against the people and all of the above, seeking opportunities for unproductive, unwarranted positions of entertainment, media, press, advertising, marketing, and the academy, for which they promote their false promises, baiting the hazard, the ultimate means of of exploiting trust and profiting from others' hardship by unaccountability, finance, and law, with medicine alone the virtuous pursuit. Like the list of side effects in one of those parts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous. You said they never innovated. That's a lot of innovation. No, I know. <laughs> That's what I mean. They innovate in lying and crime. I mean, um, and they think it's good and they feel proud of it. Okay, so this is where I want to get in the interesting, the next interesting bit. So uh, this is the institutionalization of the process by which mothers regulate the emotional state of their children, right? So what you'll notice with why the Jewish people are successful in the media is storytelling. What Europeans testify, Jews tell stories. What's the difference between the capacity for loading, framing, obscuring, fictions, fictionalism, evasion, denial, and deceit in testimony, which is operationalism, versus storytelling? It's a language of storytelling is the language of lies. So they do uh, uh, faith healing, providing temporary psychological relief. Why do they want us to to respect people's feelings. Why do they want us to do feels over reals? Why do they want us to face before, uh, face before truth? Delay, faith healing. They're preventing people from growing. They use false storytelling, baiting you into empathy, loading, framing, obscurantism, uh, obscurantism suggestion, suspension of disbelief, and overloading. If you want, Brian, in the movie industry, it's called suspension of disbelief, right? Yeah. How is it created? Uh, well, usually you have to start with a premise that's beyond what people understand. Yes. And so you create suspension of disbelief, but in our ancient history, it was myths around, the, around fires, right? Stories around fires. Yeah. Um, they give a false promise baiting to hazard, right? They use false criticism and critique, undermining into hazard. They use duplicitous, double standard, irreciprocal, and polylogical ethics. And they, that's the least escalation of the problem. Then they do it at every opportunity, every false promise they can. Uh, there's a great piece out by how, here's, here's how to defend Israel, right? I mean, th and they mass produce these kind of things um, within the community, how to mass, how to defend, here's how to attack this person. This stuff is mass produced by instinct as, um, as because they specialize in manipulation and deception. So you have faith in the opportunity, selling false promise if they can, evading, silencing every necessity, undermining if they have the opportunity, attacking if they can get away with it, hiding behind plausibility. Oh, we're oppressed. So what's their means of warfare? They have low numbers, inability to hold territory, failure at state building, a cultural disposition for avoidance of productivity, a history of parasitism, and, but yet they conduct total war from within by the, evading the one kind of war we talk about as war. They use delay, deceive, undermining, sowing discord, destroying genetic, normative, cultural, institutional capital by disinformation, deceit, defamation, sedition, and treason, using baiting to hazard by false promise of freedom cons constraints from the formal, physical, natural, and evolutionary law. They advocated by pilful, defended by critique, escaping liability and warranty by pretense of plausible deniability. I'm, I I'm using the repetition here for a purpose. Um, despite deliberate avoidance of due diligence and deliberate evasion of warranty, deliberate escape from liability, given the asymmetry of knowledge, dependence upon instincts, the presence of malincentive, 
by both agents and victims and pursued by for the purpose of attention, reward, profit, influence, power, undermining power, and the trust and cooperation of a population in normal distribution, thereby generating accelerating cycles of internal conflict, generating demand for authority to control the hazard, control to control it by the very people who made it happen. In other words, they function as the ancient fertile crescent priesthoods, face healers, and usurers by parasitic rather than productive citizens. You call them what, Brad? Sorcerers? Yes. So we see the evidence in their specialization of the production of authoritarian religion, pseudoscience, sophistries, deceits, and frauds, right? But it's not, ju it's not in just the obvious. What Cantor and Bohr did to mathematics was attempt to reverse the revolution that Descartes did. By re Descartes restored uh, mathematics to the engineering physical in the Greek and Roman tradition. These freaking guys and Einstein, they set it back. So we have, uh, so we have Gould, Bose, and Freud in the behavioral pseudosciences. We have Marx and Lenin in false behavior economy. We have Trotsky, Strauss, and Crystal in neoconservative. We have Marcus, uh, uh, Adorno, Marcus Fromm in cultural Marxism. We have Gramsci, Derrida in postmodernism to undermine tr truth itself. Frieden Steinem to, in the anti-male, anti-familial feminism. What's the first institution of Western civilization? The family. Because where does responsibility get created? As an instinct in the family. Um, where do we have, Rand, my favorites to pick on, always, I love to say this in front of libertarians, Rand and Rothbard and anti-rule of law, anti-nationalist libertarianism. <laughs> Um, the most insidious is the, is the one that I have to deal with, you guys probably don't know about, but the Raz, Kelson, Dork, and Hart in positive or pseudoscientific law. This, this is as, the problem with this is people don't know this, but that's as bad as Marx. So I have to defeat these guys. So they make pseudoscientific law. And they bring relativism. So basically, Jewish law is authoritarian. The French copied somewhat this balance with Napoleonic law, authoritarian. The, the reason UK couldn't really fit into Europe is because it's the common law. The Anglo states are common law. We're still empirical, but they're authoritarian. So they conduct war against every single discipline. I don't know if any of you have seen this chart, but in engineering, we have so many people we can't measure them. In computation, we started with a Babbage. They didn't have one. It, I, when I put around parentheses, it's a person who flipped. In, uh, we, in computation, we have Wolfram and Turing. We, in science, we have Galilei to, to, to Maxwell, to everybody in between. Wh who's here? So this is the stuff that's the tr truth of the physical world. Down in economics, we have Smith versus Ricardo. Menger and Keynes who flipped against Marx and Simmel. You may not know these people. We have Marshall and Hayek against Friedman who's sort of trudged and Krugman who's um, Jevons versus Stig Stiglitz. Mankiw and Taylor versus Samson Samuelson. Cochran versus Goolsby and Sayer. And mathematics with Euler and Boole versus Can Cantor. Poincaré versus Bohr. Schrodinger versus Einstein. There isn't any equivalent to Hilbert. Um, in ling language, we have Russell, Russell versus Wittgenstein, philosophy, Frege versus no one, logic, Gödel versus Kripke. Um, in history, we have uh, Durant and Toynbee versus, these are the biggest new liars in the world, Zinn and Harari. I mean, it's, it's Howard Zinn is the people's, so it's the people's history or whatever it is. What a work of fiction. Harari is intellectually embarrassing. I, I, he's actually, I view him as evil, and he's so proud of it. In evolution, we have given versus Gould and Lewontin. There's a thing called Lewontin's fallacy. You know what that is? Everybody know what Lewontin's fallacy is? So it's the, it's the races are, the difference between people across races is smaller than the difference within. In anthropology, apology, Bose and Reich is sort of teetering on it. He does the largest genetic research lab, so if you see all this research on Indo-Europeans or whatever coming out, he's the one that does it. And his problem is, in 2018, he's the guy that came out and said, um, I'm the, you know, he didn't say this, but it's true. I'm the largest, I have the largest knowledge base of genetics that's ever been produced in this world. And I gotta tell you, you're gonna have to get used to it. There are huge differences between the races. Right? And he had to back, they tried to kill him over it. I mean, they tried to wipe him out because of it. You can't, they couldn't though. 
So when I was, I remember we had sex differences, right? That, that happened, the sex differences in behavior was in the teens. Uh, they just run by 2012, basically. So race differences by 2018. We had IQ differences um, um, very early, and we had falsified the naturalistic, the um, nature versus nurture debate. It's all, it's all nature. We had falsified that by uh, 2000. So we've consensuously falsified all these liars. But what happened? Because they were able to false accuse, right? I brought up false, rolling false applications. Because they were able to make rolling false accusations with a false promise in them, it allowed the academy to teach it until it was falsified. Now we have people out there believing this stupid shit, just like we have people out there believing these false accusations in the news. Oh, and we gotta do the favorites. So it, we have um, these, I am a disciple of these two men, which should be obvious. Um, Hayek is the uh, uh, capital, capital structure in law, and Scalia is the guy who, the, the reason the Supreme Court's not making stup as many stupid decisions today is because of this man and, the, and a bunch of people at Yale and Chicago back in the 80s who said, this has got to stop, and they created the, the um, Federalist Society. Um, so we have Raws who flipped on us versus Dworkin and Epstein. Epstein's over here. Epstein's, uh, he's the leading natural law guy. Um, uh, there's no equivalent to Machiavelli. Keegan versus Ben Creveld. I know Martin pretty well. Clausewitz, uh, or Little Heart. I think that's. So um, in metaphysics, it's physical, operational versus verbal and mental, reporting versus storytelling, testimony versus framing, empirical versus ideal, political versus social, national versus universal, truth versus reasonableness, consideration and acceptance versus evasion and denial, and truth decidability versus delayed, um, evade, excuse, and justify. It's uh, conflict strategy bias is argument, dual and war versus social predation and undermining. The cognitive bias and developmental strategy is a male paternal versus female maternal, hierarchical versus egalitarian, paternal versus female, maternal independence versus infantilization, and autonomy versus dependence. So the evolu so and we see this in the, this is uh, where I got this from. So we have Yahweh, dialectical materialism, the Messiah, Marx, Democratic Party, the elect proletariat, the oppressed, the church, the Communist Party, the woke academy, second coming, the revolution, white replacement, hell, punishment, punishment of whites, uh, punishment of capitalists, punishment of whites, millennium, communist, commonwealth, globalism, white, Mesopotamian, slayer. You know, so you go through this. They've been doing the same thing. Now, I showed you the eight, this, the, I showed you the, the seven versions <coughs> of it yesterday, but they've been doing this forever. I mean, so uh, they're, 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 their goals consist of racism and, identification, and identitarianism, separation, separatism, supremacy, nepotism, uh, logic, polylogicalism, fictionalism, parasitism, and hazarding. Undermining, sedition, insurrection, rebellion, revolution, murder and destruction, civilization, destruction, and generacy, and globalism. They're trying to create basically a priesthood that operates by the same method of lying using financial power instead of physical power. This is how they, they conduct war. A small external population, a vanguard undermines uh, by mainstream and criticism. The population, second, is population is undermined into submission by the sale of a false promise. And the third is the major external population conquers um, through, through raiding uh, of trade routes, immigration, conversion, whatever. The best way to think about what they do is a cult and they practice a war of religious conversion. And that's what they do, which is what Christianity, Judaism, and excuse me, Judaism uses it as opposition. Christianity and Islam use it as means of conquest. You must fight the war on your terms, not on the enemies, but you must defeat the. They have to know they've lost. We have to make sure they know they have lost. That's the only way to get them to change. Once you see what they're doing, this is our power. Yeah. So when you say we need to teach a lot, we really need to get to where they see it. So whoever said, like, you should use your children, whatever. if we can get basically the legitimacy of its scale, the Constitution, and then a bunch of basically posters, or I, I was thinking of like Schoolhouse Rock that shows what they're doing, it's over. Game over. Because you, once you see it, you can't not. 
All right, I'm Kirk Doolittle for the Natural Law Institute, uh, founder of Proprietarians of National Law Institute. I, my work is the benefit not just of me, but of everybody, not only in this room, but many other people outside of it. Um, this is a collective effort by a lot of very smart people who have deep moral conviction about uh, making the world a better place for our people and by extension mankind, although it's okay if the rest of mankind doesn't catch on as long as we take care of our people. I'd right, love you all and thanks for being a great audience.